You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm here with Chad Van Camp from Garmin, Uh, one of the, I don't know, engineers that kind of helped build the zero, kind of help build the zero site. And, um, I wanted to have Chad on the podcast because as many of you know, I have used the Garmin zero site since, mm, what was it? January, February? It's about uh, what middle of February. We got together in Texas and did that, that hog hunt down there. Yep. So I have used since used the Garmin site on a uh, uh, number of hunts. I've gotten quite familiar with it. Um, it's gone through some changes and some updates. So I kind of wanted to have chat on here and go over those. I know a lot of you have followed along. I get a lot of questions about the site. So today I wanted to kind of do a level set on the status of that site and where I'm at with it, uh, as of right now and get, uh, get Chad to explain some things about the site and answer some questions. I figure this is kind of the sort of thing that I want to learn about and uh, I'll pass this on to everybody else tuning in. Okay. So Chad, uh, real quick, just tell some people that are listening that, that haven't heard from you before a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I am the product manager for the zero bow site, uh, here at Garmin. Uh, I also manage some of our, uh, GPS handhelds that, uh, like the Rhino and the Oregon and Montana and some of those. So, it's a fun job. I really, I mean, it's a great company to work for. And, you know, I just, I love coming in every day and working with really talented, dedicated people and making products like the bow side has just been uh, kind of a dream come true for me. So. so to explain this site, basically just for, just, just for people who are listening that don't, don't know a lot about it. Um, the Garmin zero site allows you to come to full draw, uh, and at full draw range an object, like a deer or an elk or whatever your target is, range your target. There's an LCD reading at the top and it'll tell you what the range is. And then when you take your finger, there's a little button basically that allows you to range it on the, on the riser where you're, where you're holding the bow. You take your finger off that button and it'll drop a pin within like a single pin sliding site. It'll drop the exact yardage pin that you need to take the shot. So that's it in a nutshell. It also acts as a fixed pin site. That same button you use to scan the object that you're about to shoot. You just take your finger and tap it a second time and it'll give you a set of fixed pins that you've preset as well. So if you have trouble ranging an object in, in, a, in this, the matter of a split second, you can simply jump to a uh, fixed pin scenario that's no different than any other fixed pin site that we traditionally use in archery. Exactly. Yep. And also, I mean, what's, what's cool about our product is, you know, you can range at rest, which is, is a feature that we, when we started out designing that site, we said, look, if you can't range at rest, like it's not an option, like we will figure out how to do this. And so that's where, when we talk about the reticle and the pin, that's where that allows that uh, function to happen. Yeah. So when you say range at rest, what you're saying is, um, at, you don't have to come to full draw to use the range finder in, in the site. Like you can just look at it through the, through the site and with a couple of, uh, 
you know, just, just by range, just by looking through the site housing, you can range basically. Right. Because you need, you know, when you're at full draw, you've got like two points to make a line and the deer or the target makes the third point, right? Mm -hmm. You have your eye, which is if you have a consistent anchor, it's always in the same spot and you have the pin. And so with, without being at full draw, you still need those three points to be a straight line. And so what we use then is um, a reticle, which kind of appears like it's about a half meter in front of you. And then that pin kind of, it appears like it's on the lens and then your target creates the third point. And so without having to be at full draw, you line up three things and you've got a straight line to the target. Yeah. So I have used the site to hunt hogs in Texas and out at and a few other weird animals. Uh, I've used it to, on my bear hunt in BC, I used it extensively, put it through tests on a live, on a, a live hunt. And that film I made called Consuming Life, um, you can see me using the site and, and I used it to kill that bear that I harvested on that hunt. Um, and I also used it in New Zealand. Uh, I've used it at the total archery challenge in both Pennsylvania and at, um, at, at Snowbird. And then Chad jo- joined me at Snowbird, uh, to shoot for the first time. And so Chad, what did you think about total archery challenge by the way? Oh, that event was amazing. I was so excited to come out and try that out. And uh, I, I got a lesson in humility for sure. So I brought lots of arrows so I could I could be humbled many, many times over. But yeah, that was a lot of fun for sure. But I learned something about shooting that I didn't quite think was going to happen was, you know, I, I started out, I sighted my bow in out to like 90 um, at about a thousand feet elevation and like super, super, um, super high humidity. So the air was super thick that day. And then, you know, I show up out there and our first shot was at like 10,000 feet. And, you know, my arrow sailed like eight inches over the back of the target and at 40 yards, right? So, I mean, I, sh- I shoot a lot. I'm not going to claim I'm an expert, but I can hit it 40 yards all day long. And <laughs> and uh, I couldn't that day. And I think it was a matter of less air pressure and, and elevation, just less drag on the arrow. And that thing was sailing. So for me, that had I had to compensate the rest of the day. Uh, for that, for that overage a little bit. Yeah. And I, that's something I want to talk about a little bit is, um, okay. So I've used the site in, in those, all those different scenarios. I put it through its paces. Um, and one thing I want to skip to is, um, I had an early version, uh, prototype that we used in Texas. It, and here and there I had different sorts of glitches and issues with it. Uh, and, Since that time, and I've reported back to you, hey, this is a problem. Hey, this is a problem. I don't like this. I want you to change that. And what Garmin has done is they've gone back to the drawing board each time and, and basically level set and, 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 uh, fix the problems. So the last, uh, I use the, the, um, I've had the, the newest version of the site for the one that you're basically putting in customers' hands right now. I have, that one since snowbird and it has performed flawlessly like yeah like all the bugs and anything that was going on with the earliest versions i got back in february seemed to be utterly resolved so um pretty stoked about that because uh as you and i spoke a couple times like it, the thing is incredible and it actually does what it says it's going to do, which was kind of a shocker. I was the biggest skeptic and usually am. I thought it was going to be an utter failure or frustrating piece of equipment. And it's turned out to be a dream actually. Um, and it seems to me like this site, it's funny. Like a lot of people were anti-technology. They're like, man, if you have that site, it's like cheating. Um, and we can argue all day about that, but I just use it in New Zealand and guess what? I didn't kill a tar, you know? Um, in fact, I missed a couple of times and, um, nothing to do with the site either. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because, um, you know, it, I, I have learned now using the site that it's, it's really a joy to use and on a compound bow with all the technology that I have, I feel like I want to stick with, I mean, I like the modern site. So just, just for example, just for example, you and I showed up to the total archery challenge in snowbird and 
we show up at the event and frustratingly, um, I left my bow at the bow shop and then had Jordan Harbertson pick it up and bring it up. Well, he grabbed the bow, but he left my bow case there. Not really his fault, but he left it there and it had my stabilizers and it had my, my, my releases in it, my release aids and a bunch of other stuff. So I show up at the total archery challenge and I've got my bow and a different release. Um, and it doesn't have any stabilizers or anything on it. And so everything shoots a lot, shoots a little different, especially, and it's not such a big deal when you're shooting 40 yards and in or 45 yards and in, but it starts to make a, a big difference in accuracy as you start stretching out those yardages. And a lot of, as you saw at the total archery challenge, a lot, a lot of those shots start at like 60 yards and out, you know, <laughs> I think there was like two under 40 and then I think the rest of them were 60 yards and beyond for, for certain, man, those things, whatever course we shot, man, that thing was ridiculous. And so I think that day we shot the, the Sitka course or the prime course. Um, can't remember, but basically, um, I show up with the wrong setup. And so I go to the target range real quick and I shoot and I can, I can see that my, um, my arrows are shooting eight inches high. So I'm like, whoa, this is a lot different. The anchor point changes a little bit with a different, cause I had to borrow a release from somebody. So everything changes a little bit. And so with a normal sight, I would be, I would be screwed because I wouldn't really know from yardage to yard at 30 yards. I was eight inches high. What am I at 50? What am I at 78? What am I at a hundred? So real quick, I just went into the, into the profile settings on the bow. And I just told it, Hey, at 30 yards, I'm eight inches high. And it says, okay, uh, re pin recalibrated. And so then I shoot and I hit a bullseye and it says, did you hit the bullseye? And I say, yes. And it says, okay, 30 yard pin is now set. So the net, and we did this on the course. The first shot I shot was about 30 or 40 yards and I was eight inches high. So I just set that pin Next one I went to was like 45 yards or something. I shot that. I was sighted in. I went to the next one and it was, I got to somewhere where it was like 83 yards or something. So I basically told it, it, it projects a pin each time and I shot and I hit it in the spine and I, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm a little high here. And then I shot a little low and then, and then finally I hit a bullseye a couple of times and it calibrates. So each time on the fly, I just shot one or two, uh, two to three arrows at each target. And within four, four targets, I was calibrated from zero to 85 yards with the sight, with the release I had and the arrows in this current setup that I ended up with on the range. And then I was able to shoot the whole course with accuracy the rest of the day. There's no yeah, you, way, there's no way you can do that with another sight. You cannot sight in like that in moments and then be dialed and calibrated. It's like having a built in, you know, archer's choice, like computer into your site. You know, norm, like for example, before we went up there, Gar Chad shows up on an airplane. I pick him up at the airport and I'm like, look, I'm trying to get my black gold sliding pin, three pin sight dialed in for, for this shoot and I'm going to shoot the Garmin on my other bow. So you and I, and I spent a couple of days trying to get that site dialed. So I show up and we go out to this dirt road over by wild arrow. Um, this long, long dirt road on a, in between some farm fields. And we have a giant block target and there's like 20 people there. And we're all trying to side in for the tack before, <laughs> before it starts the next day. And, uh, and basically I have to manually sight it in. I, I get my 20 and my, my, I get my 30, 40 and my 50 yard pins set by using an Allen key and adjusting them where I want them to be. Once I got them all set up, then I started shooting, um, what I thought was like 70, 80, like out to 85 yards. And then I made a mark on there and then they printed off a sight tape at the bow shop. We came back. And I confirmed whether the sight tape was on or off, or on or not. And at a hundred yards, it was off, uh, you know, three or four inches. I grouped, 
you know, too high or too low. I can't remember. And so then we went back in and they redid the site tape again. And then I went out and confirmed it. And it took the whole thing took a few hours. Now I have it all dialed, you know, from zero to like 130 yards or something with the sliding with the slider. Okay. So my black gold is set as long as I use the exact setup I've got right now, the release, as long as I use the same field points, as long as I use the same knocks, as long as I use the same stabilizer, like everything, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. So that bow is set up. It's kind of fixed. And, and if I tweak anything, like let's say I put, for example, I'm shooting the Valkyrie arrows and Brent Hahn has designed those. So I'm shooting a 200 grain tip on my, uh, 250 spine shaft. It's about a 505 grain arrow, but I have some that sh- that I have lighted knocks for six of them that I'm going to use for hunting. Well, those arrows fly differently than the ones without lighted knocks. Furthermore, the Valkyrie broadheads are five grains heavier, so they're actually 205 grains, while the field tips are 200 grains. So they don't shoot to the exact same spot because it's an extra five grains of weight between the field tip and the broadhead. So when I step back to, let's say, 100 yards, you're really going to see the difference between that target tip and the broadhead tip. So I don't... If I use the black gold, I really got to dial it in for the broadheads and then I'm forced to shoot those broadheads until the season starts, you know, for accuracy and to verify that everything is dialed. I have to get a whole new site tape or a whole new site or if I'm going to and and go through the work of manually setting that up uh to in order for those field tips and broadheads to shoot to the same spot or my my knocks to shoot to the same spot. And sometimes I like to use a hinge release or a trigger or I like to use the thumb button. That's what I'm using right now. And that changes it as well. So here's the brilliant part about the Garmin that I just find a joy is I can build a different profile for each setup. And within a few minutes, 10 minutes, I can have each, I can have a profile for shooting with pinpoint accuracy, shooting my field tips, I can have a profile built for my broadheads and I just select my broadhead profile when I'm hunting and I go back to my field tip when I'm practicing and I'm dialed. I can do the same thing between releases. I can do the same thing with my, my lighted knocks versus my regular knocks and having all that flexibility in the, in the bow like that is brilliant. And then if I end up somewhere where like the air is thinner, like you know, a thousand foot elevation versus 10,000 foot elevation. And, you, and, and you're noticing a significant difference in aero flight due to the change in, in, in air, the thickness of the air. Um, I think, you know, being able to change it on the fly within 15 minutes or so of just confirming a few shots, you can have that thing dialed and be out hunting again, like perfectly. So it's, yeah. it's really a, it's really like, it's a whole new Star Wars level of convenience compared to the old school sliding site. Now, there are some, some things that come that the Garmin can't do. And that is really get to those hundred plus yard shots. So I'm, I'm, you know, it's, I don't, I haven't messed with my fast bow yet to see how far I can push the site. I imagine it's going to get me right around a hundred yards. And then because it's not a sliding site, I'm going to be capped at that. But for hunting, I don't really care for hunting. That's just fine. That doesn't bother me. Um, I'm not shooting an animal at those ranges beyond that. Uh, but that is for guys that, that, that care about that. That is a, that is a drawback. Yeah. It's something we need to consider, um, in the future, but, um, if you, if I may, I want to make a couple points real quick. So the first one being, you know, when you talked about your, um, your struggles with that, it was kind of like a pilot run site that we gave you down in Texas. Um, so hardware wise, every site we've made from then on has been the same. Um, but, and the software guys would get mad at me, but we always, sometimes we'll say, well, it's just software. But in this particular case, like 
you know, you make a few hundred of them in, um, in your development plan, you know, and then you start to ship out to a bunch of people and, and, you know, the early adopters of the site found bugs that we hadn't found yet, used it in ways we hadn't used it, those types of things. So, um, you know, we, we love that feedback. Um, we have a great customer support center that listens to all those, that feedback and gives it directly to the engineers. And so by, you know, now the site that you've got is run same hardware as the site you originally got, but it's got 2.80 software on it, which basically fixes every bug that anybody's ever found. And so it's super solid. We've been running that for a couple months now with, with no issue. Yeah. Um, some of the things that I ran into was it would freeze on me. And I've heard other guys, um, you know, kind of mention something similar where it would kind of lock up. I thought it was due to heat. We still, I still don't know for sure, but it, it would lock up uh, on a really hot day. And, and now I'm not experiencing anything like that. Right. Um, another thing that I would experience, um, uh, was looking through the reticle. I, it, sometimes the lights weren't bright enough and I had a hard time lining up the reticle. And now it's like, like so easy. It's perfect. Yeah. That's, that's a little, I mean, that's software too. And that's just making that adjustment between, you know, when you go in and set your brightness settings, <clears throat> we want that pin to be where, where you say you want it in terms of its brightness because the brighter you make it, the bigger it is. And I like a really dimly lit pin that looks like a, you know, a freckle on the target. But you have to be able to also balance that with well, how bright should that reticle be um, in order to understand that the pin's in the center of it. Yeah. Um, but you can customize that with a few clicks of a button here and there. And depending on whatever your style is you can set it how you want. And before I just had a hard time getting it bright enough on a, on a sunny day to quickly acquire target when I was at rest and range. So that's the, the other problem that I ran into was ranging black bears or black objects. Uh, now and like often, um, I, I couldn't get a reading on a black object. So I'd have to range the grass next to it or a tree next to it, you know, get, which was, which was a common problem with range finders in general. A lot of range finders I have that I've used do the exact same thing. And so you range a black object and it just, bloop, just gives you a zero reading. So you quickly range something right next to it. It's a habit that I've mastered. You know, I don't get too hung up. I don't need exact one yard incremental accuracy, especially at closer ranges. So I'm able to, to work around it. But it, but now I went to TAC and I've used it since with the new software and it has ranged, it has given me a range on all the black targets I've, sh I've shot at. Right. And, and black bears are hard to range in general because the coat is not reflective. It's the least reflective color there is. And they're so woolly, right? And hairy mm -hmm. that that's it basically just scatters light. So we, you know, our, our spec, uh, is 100, 100 yards to deer and 300 yards to reflective targets. And, and the site will do that all day long. And we don't use a lot of power because we don't need to. It's a hunting site. It's not designed to be a rifle range finder that, you know, can go out hundreds and hundreds of yards. Right. Um, but on bears, we uh, in tests here, we're getting about 65 yards max to a bear on a bright, sunny day. So if you had, you know, a overcast conditions or if you were, you know, more at dusk where you get less solar flares and things, you'd probably be able to reach out a little bit farther. But, I mean, 65 yards to a bear is a pretty good poke with an arrow. Yeah. So, I mean. No, and, and that's nice to be able to range a bear, get that reading in the moment. Which So, so here's – you. I just released that tar film, um, mm -hmm. Kiora, that we got from uh, – that I did in New Zealand. And for those that have watched it or are, are watching it, I've got a few messages from people wondering – you know, why I missed. And, uh, a couple of people are like, was it the Garmin site? Was it the Garmin site? I, pr I probably asked you the same question. <laughs> and so, uh, no folks, I just missed. Um, basically though, um, you know, you can see in the film, what's great about the site and you can see it just in action in the film was I could quickly adjust it while after I land at the, in the, off the airplane, I can make any tweaks I need to, uh, for elevation or whatever really quickly with modifying a few pins. It's recalibrated. It's a really, um, it's really easy to use. And then in addition to that, for example, 
when I shoot that tar, shoot at that tar around 60 yards, um, I don't, I don't know if I could have got the same shot off, um, uh, if I had to range it. And so you'll see in the film, if you've watched it, there's a tar coming up the hill and Casey is, is, uh, has his bow in hand and he's getting ready to shoot it and he has to sneak his little rangefinder out and he's like bringing it up real slow and the tar has spotted him. He's bringing it up and he's getting a range with it. And then he's, and the whole time the tar is staring at him like, okay. And he's like sneaking the rangefinder back into the pocket. Eight Casey dials his sight to the correct yardage. And then he goes to full draw and takes the shot. Well, the whole time that's happening, that, that he's burning valuable time while that tar is just staring him down. Right. And so, contrast that with my experience where there's a tar pushing a nanny up a hill and the tar ends up walking broadside to 65. I don't mess around with the range finder with all that extra movement with dialing my sight and all that kind of stuff. I just basically come to full draw when the tar's not looking. He can kind of sense something. He turns around, he kind of, you know, I don't know, they're so switched on. And so he's kind of like, a little jumpy and he doesn't really see me, but he, he definitely like notices something. I'm at full draw though. And I just range him with the Garmin gives me the yardage. It's perfect. I settle in for the shot. I'm pulling a, I'm using a hinge on this, on this. I'm sitting flat on my butt, which was not what I wanted to be. And I'm twisted backward a little bit. I was on my knees earlier, which is I'm a pretty good shot from my knees, but flat on my butt. Um, with my legs straight out. It was an awkward position. You can't see on the film. And then I'm kind of twisted back behind myself. So I'm using some ab and core and everything. I'm trying to steady that shot. And then I got a hinge on top of that. And I'm trying to pull through the shot. And by the time I just can't get it to go off, it just won't go, it won't go, it won't go. And finally that shot breaks, but I put a lot of tension on the bow trying to pull through that shot and I'm not steady and I shoot over its back. And it runs off. But the part that was great was um, just n- not having to worry about movement at at ranges where those tar within 60 yards, like as soon as they spotted us, they were gone. I was able to just come to full draw, range, get my exact yardage pin with pinpoint, like single yard accuracy, all in the, all, all at full draw without doing all that stuff that Casey did. So it's a huge advantage, uh, I think over, over, uh, um, you know, your traditional kind of sliding site. Um, well, and what's cool about it too, is when you take that range at full draw, right. And then that pin pops up inside that reticle circle, you know, your anchor point, at least with your eye is correct. Right. And so, you know, it was cool how you embraced changing pins at tack, like right away. And I was like, dude, calm down, man. Just, just adjust or let's take a few more shots and see how things are going. But you knew that something wasn't right. Me, on the other hand, the engineer in me was like, why am I hitting so high? Because when I I had to take my sight off the bow to fit it in the case. And when I put it back on at wild arrow, I drew back and my pin and reticle are lined up. And that tells me that the sight is lined up to my eye the way it was before I left Kansas. So when I get out there to tack and I'm eight inches high on the first target, and I'm like, well, maybe I'm just nervous shooting with Gritty and all these people. <laughs> then I'm eight inches high on the next target. I'm like, no, nerves aside, man, I'm not doing too well. But I didn't want to mess with anything because I wanted to leave it in that configuration and then bring it back to Kansas, 1,000 feet of elevation and super high humidity. And I put it back on, and I could tell that it was back on the way that I had put it on when I left Kansas and the way I put it on when I was in Utah because the reticle and that pin line up when I go to range at full draw. 40 yards at our archery range, you know, arrows hitting right behind the pin. So for me, I, I know that there was something to the difference in altitude that day. And, you know, I've asked a few elk guys that are hunting in elevation, and they don't believe me, but I proved it to myself there's something there. So Yeah. Um, but the cool thing is, is the reticle tells me that I'm lined up or not. So Right. Well, that's something to, to kind of touch on that was kind of an added feature that I like about the site is when I come to full draw, 
the radical is basically a circle. And with, uh, you got that circle and then there's a, there's a red dot or a green, there's a dot that basically moves into the center of the circle when everything's lined up. When those two converge, you're, you're golden. Your, your, your position at full draw is the same position when you're at target, when you're practicing, like how you set it up, um, when you sight it in the target. So, you know, your form is dialed when, Mm -hmm. when those reticles don't line up, you know, something's not right about the site or something's not right about you and your form and where you're anchoring. So it's, and what I noticed when I, when I got there to tack, when I shot eight inches high, I've, I've sighted in the site multiple times and built so many profiles, depending on which arrow configuration I'm using or which, which release I was using. It was not a thing for me to be like, okay, I shot eight inches high, go into my 30 yard pin, tell it I was eight inches high, boom, recalibrate, go to the next target. I was three inches low, boom, recalibrate, go to the fourth target. I was a few inches high, recalibrate. And then once you get three pins, like 30 to 50 or 30 to 60, you know, or 20 to 30 or or 40. I mean, once you get like three yardages down, I like to just jump right out to like 80 or 90 yards inside in that fourth pin. And then basically I'm sighted in from zero to whatever that longest shot is at that point. Well, that's what we did on the course. And within four or five targets, my sight was set and it literally, I can do it on the fly at any time. Um, And that's just a powerful tool, I think. Um, And it just makes it fun to use. And then I could go back the next day and I can run my other profile and shoot my arrows the way I had them before. And so I feel like, yeah, I feel like the more a person gets used to the technology, uses it, plays around with it, the more they're going to value it. Now, uh, in New Zealand, there was a lot of fog, a lot of fog. And so there were two things that happened with this site. One was it wouldn't give me a range in thick fog. But the same thing was true for the Swarovski Bino rangefinder, which sucked. And then it was even worse than any of the other rangefinders we used. And then Casey used the SIG rangefinder, which worked pretty well in the fog, but it would crap out in the cold. It just would, wouldn't give him a range. It would just freeze, lock up. So we used the Leupold range finder and it was by far the best range finder in the fog and the cold and the most reliable about returning a result. Um, we ended up using the Leupold a lot in the fog because it would get us, it would, it would get us the best results, but it still would come back in thick fog and say eh, 20 yards when it's like 70, you know? So, the Garmin is just like any other rangefinder. It it is has the same limitations that other rangefinders do, and all rangefinders struggle in the fog. I knew that going into it, and and so that's why I have a fixed pin set up as well in the rangefinder in the in the Garmin. So you know, it, when I got into a situation where the fog was really thick, I would use the Leupold rangefinder, little handheld. And if that worked, then I would use my fixed pins. If it didn't work, I was in the same boat I would be in in any other situation. And I just had to guess the yardage based on my own, you know, guesstimation. And I would have my fixed pins again that I would use. Most of the time, though, the shots I took, I, the first shots I took, I had to, it took us a while to get a range that we were confident in. And by the time I got the range, I came to full draw and I used the fixed pins because I couldn't get a range with the Garmin. Second shot was the same. I used my fixed pins. But again, it's the same limitations that any site gives. And because it can go from that to a fixed pin site in a matter of seconds, a split second, a millisecond, to me, there's there's not a real disadvantage. Uh, It's I'd be in the same boat whether I had the Garmin or I had another site. The other yep. thing though, is that there were some mornings, a couple times in the morning where the, the lens got a little bit, you're talking like that. I don't, I don't know that there was a place with more fog and humidity than New Zealand, 
I think they said that there's more fresh water in New Zealand than any produced by New Zealand than any other country in the world. Something ridiculous like that. The humidity and the fog you can like walk through. It's like, it's like water, like you're cutting through water. And so in that situation, I think some spots in Alaska, I've experienced the same, that situation along with an extreme temperature change from warm to cold, the lens on the Garmin would get a little bit of film, a little bit of fog on it and fog up just a touch, but it was not, it never fogged up to an extent where I couldn't take an effective shot. So it's still, um, it was still easy to see through. I could still acquire a target and I could still take a shot without doing anything to clean it off. So I did wipe it off a couple of times, um, during, during those, those hunts, but, um, with every piece of technology you're dealing with, um, whether it's mechanical or electrical technology, there's always going to be pros and cons. There's going to be things that you're, you're going to be trading for one thing or the other. So for me, the ability to range at full draw and get exact yardage accuracy, that's a really big bonus, a big plus in that critical moment that counts. So if it fogs up on me a little bit, but I can still shoot effectively, I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to accept that given the pros that come with the ranging. But more than that, Chad, I always, I thought the range finding tech was going to be the thing that I liked about the site and is going to be why, why I would, why I wanted to use it. The reality is I like using it as a fixed pin. Often, that's what I always shoot. I shoot 30, 40, 50, and often 60 with fixed pins. Anything 60 and under, which is most animals, I shoot fixed pins. The Garmin allows that. I don't, I don't need to use the rangefinder in it from a lot of what I do. But what I found that is the, the big benefit that I love about it is the different profile setups. What I love about it is the reticle alignment. So I can tell whether I have good form or not. And I, I like that it'll tell me if I, sh- if when I shot, if I, my bow is canted left or right and by how many degrees. Like it's a good training tool, but it's just a convenience tool. That's something I totally didn't expect to appreciate. Right. And that, I mean, that sight picture too is really, I mean, it's so clean, right? And that's, that's an advantage of the lens and, you know, the disadvantage of fogging and, but you know, the fog you were in is, is a pretty extreme case. And as you mentioned, you can still take a shot. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I used maybe, it, I used it in British Columbia and it was very foggy and cold and, and wet and it never fogged up. It, the only time I've had it fog up a, and it was not by much, like I said, it was in New Zealand and it was right next to a river, cold air coming off of it and thick, thick fog. Like you couldn't see. And yet uh, that's what I was, I was excited because it's like, well, if this is all, it's going to fog up because it's a single lens. It's not a double lens. It's not getting fog inside of it. It's not get, storing heat on one side and cold on the other or anything like that. Like a bino, when you put it up to your eyeballs, it, it just, it was, it, if that's the worst it, it does, I'm very confident going into some gnarly situations with it going forward. Yeah. I mean, and we tried to pack a lot of, fail safes in there that you know you people need to spend time with it to get comfortable and to understand what everything does but and you're probably aware like if your pins are too bright or too dim the left or right keys taps of those increases or decreases the brightness mm-hmm. but if you press and hold left or right you go into manual mode and then you just dial up whatever range you want so in the case of the tar that's at 60 if you can't get a range but you're using your loophole or your guide's telling you he's 52 or he's 63 you can dial up that 63 yard pin and have it. Yep. Just like you would a sliding site. Exactly. Yep. You can just hold that button down and bzz, you're right there. And the other thing we did, because, you know, we have a wired trigger, you know, is what happens if this trigger gets snagged on a, on a tree branch and you cut it or something mm-hmm. catastrophic happens. Um, if you push and tap the back button, then that basically switches you between um, the ranged pin and fixed pins. And so in the case where you, um, you have, you know, let's say you cut that cable, you could basically just turn the fixed pins on, set the time out to never, and you'd have your fixed pins right there. Or I think maybe it's, you know, five minutes is maybe the max or there, there might be a never mm-hmm. option, but, well, um, 
I've become very efficient at ranging at rest now, uh, especially with the brighter reticle that's available mm-hmm. that, that the newest version has. I can pull that thing up and I can just bzz, boom zap what I want. With my rat, with my release still attached to the bow and my hand right there ready to draw. And there's no range finder to pull out, to put away, anything like that. It's like, I can range while it's walking and go, that's 72. I'm going to wait till it's closer. Okay. It's 61. Okay. He's feeding. I'm going to draw now. And I already have my pin pre range. So I'm not using, I'm not ranging at full draw. And that's been, that's a, in the, in the beginning with the prototype I had, that would work when the light was low in the in the morning evening hours, but in the middle of the day sometimes I couldn't see the reticle, and um, that's that's not a thing anymore. Like it's bright, it's perfect. Yep. yep. But you do have to get used to it. There are things like uh, there were times where I would dial up my brightness or forget to, and so you come if you're walking around, you're elk hunting. And your brightness is low because it's dark, you know. You, when you come to full draw, you don't want a, a pin at the brightest level it can be, or you're going to get a big halo effect on the pin, and, and it'll even be hard to see your target because it's so bright. So um, I'm I walk around. I'm like I just I don't know. It's calm. It's I've shot it so much, and it's just common sense. It just I'm I'm checking the. I'm just adjusting that as the sun comes up. I'm adjusting it as the sun comes down, um, just with a couple of clicks on the top, so that my brightness is dialed in case the animal walks out. I'm ready. Um, but you do have some auto sensing levels, don't you? Yeah, we do. Um, it has a. There's a little box on the front and that's the ambient light sensor that's detecting the light in your environment so based off wherever you set your brightness preferences Mm -hmm. it tries to keep that same amount of brightness to your eye in all light levels now where that can get a little bit tricky is if you're sitting in a ground blind right and that your bow is maybe pointed more towards the sides or something or the or the base below Mm -hmm. the window it's not picking up as much light and so it's going to say oh i'm going to turn this way down and then if you bring your bow up it may take it a second to adjust to the light that's coming into it now that you want to take a shot out the window. Yeah. Um, if that, if you find yourself in that position, you can go into the settings and you can basically turn off the auto brightness adjustment and you yeah. can just set it to whatever you want. So you have it. That's yeah. why I prefer, I just prefer, prefer it to be set up manual and, and just adjust it myself. Cause I also find that I have certain preferences that I like, um, but that's been just something getting familiar with it. The batteries last forever. That's another question that guys have is, you know, how does it handle, how does it handle in the cold and the heat? Um, like I said, in the beginning, I'd have some times where it would lock up and I wanted like some kind of kill switch to, to reset it. And what I needed to do was take the battery cover off, cover off and pull out some batteries and, and put them back in to reset it with that early prototype. So far, I haven't had, I haven't been able to get the thing to lock up on me since I got the latest version. Right. That's a, I mean, that's a band aid that you were using that, you know, I apologize for. But, you know, when you tell me something like that, it's the kill switch isn't the answer, it's figuring out why it's locking up and fixing that. And so, obviously, we, we don't settle. So we figure out why it's locking up and we fix that. So there's a no need for a kill switch. Um, yeah. What'd you think? Yeah, go ahead. Say, what'd you think of like, you know, we get questions a lot of, you know, durability and, you know, waterproofness and things. And, you know, it's what do you think of using it in, in rough terrain like in uh, New Zealand? So far, I've dropped it, banged it, done a bunch of things with it. Um, you know, you're always in danger of breaking the lens or, or something. Um, I've told you I'm not a huge fan of the rail system. Like, I want that gone. I want a kick butt, like machined, precision machine rail that has micro adjustments, especially for setting up the reticle. Cause this, the initial setup of the reticle on the Garmin is a pain in the butt. And so I, that's the only part about it that I really think new people will, could get frustrated trying to set it up because it's, it's, it's not easy. Once it's set, once the reticle's set, it's a piece of cake from that point on. But that yep. the system doesn't allow for those micro adjustments, and it barely takes 
a little tiny adjustment in your reticle, you're like, oh, I'm almost lined up. And so you move it like one tick over and you're like way off again. When you're almost there, it's like it needs to move like a hair more and you don't have that precision level. So you're constantly like, oh, too far. Oh, too far. Oh, too far. Too far left. Too far right. Too far left. Too far right until I'm about to pull my hair out. And so um, I noticed that you're pretty dang good at it because when you showed up, you had it set up in like a couple of minutes. It takes me like 30, 40 minutes to get the dang reticle to line up and set up. So a machined rail with, with micro adjustments would be a game changer. In my opinion, it would take that site to another level. I also would be able to be more confident, like taking it on horseback and other things with that. That said, I've put it through its paces. I've put it through the rain, the cold, the heat. I've, I've dropped it. I've banged it. I've crawled on the ground with it. And so far, um, I haven't broke it. You know, it's, it's done well. Uh, that said, I will always, and since for the last couple of years, uh, I always have a secondary site as backup. If I don't have two bows, and even when I do have two bows on a trip, I generally have a secondary site as backup. So, for example, if I'm going all the way to, you know, let's say Oregon to hunt, okay, I'm, I'm going to take two bows. And one will be a really old bow, bow that's all dialed and ready to go, as well as my new bow. I'm also going to bring a backup sight so that I can unbolt my Garmin if I break it and I can bolt on a black gold three pin or, or whatever I'm using. And I think that's just wise, wise and responsible. You know, that's just being prepared. And the way that these things are machined, you can, you can just swap out the site and you're ready to go. So like I'm going to Yukon to hunt moose. I'm going to bring a secondary site. So I have a primary and a secondary. I'm probably going to leave my second bow at base camp and we're going to ride horses out like 20 miles. I won't bring two bows, but I'll bring two sights on that trip because it's too easy to smash your sights, your pins, your, those are just fiber optic pins. It's too easy to smash those things, break them somehow, bend it. It's like the most weak, fragile part of that bow. It sticks out the front. So having a secondary one that I can just bolt on and off is, is critical, but I do have confidence now having tested it in all this, these different situations and bringing it on, on, uh, on some trips that are where it's going to be getting banged up. Yep. Just don't take it to Oregon yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's not legal there. You know, oh, yeah, we got yeah, some work yeah. to do. We need some people to, to ask for it and help us out. Um, well, let's, it, let's talk about where, where, where it's not legal. Uh, it's not legal in Oregon and Washington, which no offense. I'm not really planning to hunt Oregon and Washington anytime soon because I'm not a big fan of Oregon. I grew up in Oregon. Um, dude, if I have the option of hunting Montana, Idaho, or Colorado, I'm hunting Idaho, Montana, or Colorado or Wyoming. Um, I would much rather spend, I, I got to a point where I lived in Oregon where I would hunt, I would hunt, uh, Idaho each year over the counter instead of Oregon. It was about the same drive to go East. Um, so for me, um, it's, it's not le but, but that's a tangent. It's not legal to hunt in Oregon and Washington. Um, it's not legal in Idaho, Colorado, or Montana, but it is legal in, correct me if I'm wrong, it is legal in Wyoming. It is legal in Utah. It is legal in Nevada. Um, it is legal in Arizona. It's legal in pretty much Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, all the whitetail states. It's not legal in the Dakotas. Correct. So, so that's kind of like our, for our interpretation of the of the of law. The, yep. It's yep. legal in Canada, as far as I know. It's not legal in Alaska. Right. So, um, in Florida, I, I think is also illegal in Florida, except. Um, there might be like a few pockets. Uh, I think there may be some, like some special federal land there that you can use it on, but yeah. And the other, the other thing we should point out and I get it, but at, at the same time, when we say not legal, we typically mean that means for big game, right? So there are 
you know, if you do like squirrel hunting or, you know, some of the lesser stuff, it's potentially legal for those species. Yep. Yeah. I, I gotta say like, um, I plan to use it in Utah. I plan to use it in Arizona. I think Arizona coos deer, it could be a game changer. You know, there are times where I was sneaking along through the bush and then I needed to come to full draw just as a deer w- went behind a tree and, but I needed to range and then dial and the deer's on the walk, but that movement, those, those coos deer would pick right up. And so there were a number, there was a couple of times where I could have killed a buck if I'd have just been able to come to full draw while the head was behind a tree or behind a bush. And then as it came out, just range it and take my shot. Yeah. I'd have been, there's a number of chances I could have capitalized on. So it's same thing with smaller targets like Coatamundi or Havelina. They're not big targets and being able to, uh, get single pin accuracy, you know, at full draw, uh, when the animal's not looking your way without all that added movement and then adjusting a pin, a slider. And, you know, um, depending on your bow speed, especially for, for women, this could be a game changer because if, if you're, if your bow shoots pretty slow, you know, cause you're drawing 40 pounds, 45 pounds or something. And, you know, you have to have a certain weight arrow to, to be an efficient, to make an efficient kill. And then you can only go so lightweight with your arrow set up. Um, you're going to have a slower shooting system. And so pin gapping for you, uh, for a 43 yard shot, aiming high or low on a target the size of a javelina could result in a miss if you're, if you just are off by a slight bit where a lot of guys that are shooting like my setup right now is shooting so flat. If, if I guess wrong, you know, by three or four yards, or I don't hold just right over or below the target, I'm still in the kill zone, even on a small target, but you shoot a rabbit, you need like single yard accuracy. And you don't have, when you're hunting jackrabbits in Arizona, you don't really have time to do single pin accuracy with a range finder with a jackrabbit. I mean, you can come to full draw, range it and shoot, but you know, it's a lot different. So I think it's going to be a game changer in, in for species and places like that. When we were hunting pigs in Texas, they don't hold still. Pigs run all over the place. They just root around and they're like, oh, and they're everywhere, right? Well, piglets are small and we were shooting our share of piglets and, um, getting, getting up, shooting a piglet is, um, to small targets, like a little walking football and, you know, 18 yards to 34 yards, like those single yard increments matter when you're aiming at a target that small. So it was, again, it was nice to just range as it's walking, 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 walking. As soon as the sucker stopped, you got your pin, you shoot. It was like, it was like, a game changer. So for situations like that, I think it's a, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a lot of, a big advantage. Um, but I plan to use it in Utah. I plan to use it in, um, Air, like I said, Arizona, uh, I plan to use it in, in, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio. Like there's a number of places where, um, the site is legal and it'll be fun to, to get it out and use it. But I said this to a few people. I, even if, even if I lived in a state where it wasn't legal, I would still own it. And this is, this is just like straight up honest. Like I would still own it simply for just the fun of it. Because, uh, even if you never hunt with it, but you shoot all year, if you shoot a lot of, of archery and you like to tinker with, different knocks and different broadhead tips and you build different arrows, you build different releases, you know, you want to try a different release. It's so convenient to just, just play with your archery gear and switch it all up and around without having to like re sight in everything. Um, you know, the way you would on a traditional setup. So, and then I think you learn a lot about your gear when you start messing around with, Let's say you want to do a, 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 you know, a 20 plus percent FOC arrow build, but then you also want to experiment with, with something that has no FOC that's, that's, you know, 500 grains and you want to experiment something that's just a super light 300 grain arrow or whatever. You can, 
you can have these uh, ranges of flexibility uh, to play around. The only thing that, that I say that you got to really mess around with is tuning. You know, sometimes you just got to make sure that whatever arrow setup you're using, that it's actually tuned uh, for that, that rig. But for the most part, that's, I can mess around with five to 15 grains in any direction, maybe even more. And I still have a great arrow flight coming out of the rig and I didn't have to sight in totally different, you know, same with the releases. Like I have, I've enjoyed messing around with all the different release aids that are available and it's nice cause they don't all shoot to the same spot. It's nice to be able to just change my profile and switch between release aids. Yep. One thing that, you know, I, I thought of and it, I talk about it quite often, but I don't know if a lot of guys do it or not, but you know, you can they talk about when you get cold in the Midwest and even on, you know, East coast, you know, your muscles get tight and that 70 pound bow you've been shooting all summer feels like 80 when you're cold. And so I, I think yeah, what for some you, guys but look, for us gritty guys, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was hesitant to even bring it up, man. <laughs> So you might practice all summer at 70 and then turn it down to maybe 65. So that 65 draws a lot nicer when you're, you know, been sitting up a tree for three hours and you're all iced up. Um, you can do that. You can have two different profiles on the A1I model where you can and set that up. And then, you know, string stretch over time, or maybe you didn't get exactly to 65. That's okay. You just go and check your, check a pin or two and make sure it's hitting where it's supposed to. And then if it's not, then dial your bow down a quarter turn or turn it up a half a turn. And, and as long as a couple pins are hitting, then you know your whole stack is where it needs to be. Well, especially like it's also super easy to recalibrate mm-hmm. for some, a few tweaks. Let's say it's shooting exactly the same out to 40, 45 yards. But as you get further out, you're starting to see some arrow drop. Well, you just quickly do like a, a re- recalibrate two or three pins and you're, perfectly dialed in the past i'd have to like go get a new sight tape i'd have to print it off check it do all the stuff and it's just so inconvenient to to change that around it's like once you get it set up you're like okay i'm not going to touch anything but some things shift on their own over time and then you're like this this way you can adjust the sight uh to match the bow as things shift a little you know, the string stretches or whatnot. So I don't know, man, it's, um, well, and you don't have to guess how far to move the pin, right? It's cause you break that little Allen head screw loose cause you were eight inches off and you got to try to guess how far to move it. Or when you're breaking it loose, it, it moves, it slides all the way up and like, Oh, well, where was it? I mean, now it's basically just a matter of shooting arrow. How many inches off are you? Oh dude, Lock I, it in, I can't, you make- I cannot tell you how irritating it is to break out an Allen key after having the Garmin like for real, it's so irritating to break out Allen key and then like undo your pin and then try to wiggle it down. And then, Oh, that's too far and wiggle it back up and tighten it. I'm like, this is the most archaic system on the planet. And some people, some companies have manufactured like a micro adjustment for each individual pin, but even most of those are ghetto and they don't work too great. But I, I definitely see how nice that is, but when you're dealing with a, with the Garmin, yeah, it says, did you shoot high or low? And I say, "Mm, I shot low. And it says, by how much? And I say, it says five inches. And I say, yes, five inches. And then it says, shoot again. I shoot. And it says, did you hit the bullseye? And I'm like, yes. And pin calibrated. Next one. I don't have to break out an Allen key. I don't have to adjust it back and forth three times. I don't have to shoot all the different shots I'd shoot. It just knows exactly if I'm shooting five inches low, what it needs to do to compensate. If I shoot a little high, it knows exactly when I tell it I was three inches high. It just moves it. And now the next yardage pin is there. It's just having the, you know, the, the arch, our archery software built right into the fun, right into the site. It's, it's brilliant. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to get it out. And like I said, just for training aid, um, I'm really enjoying it. So it's good stuff for people that are listening. Like Garmin, you're just a friend to gritty. You're not supporting the podcast. You're not, you're not uh, a sponsor of anything like that either. And I think that's, this is just really my 
genuine opinion about this thing. And, and there's a couple other sites that have come out that people have talked about and others have said, Hey, it doesn't work. It's range finding sites suck, blah, blah, blah. Gritty must be getting paid a lot of money if he's going to endorse that, blah, blah, blah. The reality is that what you guys have created, when I compare that to the other like range finding, bow mounted range finding options on the market, it's like comparing the Flintstones vehicle to like a modern, you know, race car. Like there's no, they're not the same thing. They're not even in the same league. I mean, and so yeah. you really have to, the Garmin stands alone, you know? And so when I say, yeah, I use it, I like it and it works. I'm talking about the Garmin. I'm not talking about other range finding, uh, bow mounted sites. Yeah. I mean, that's a testament to the engineering teams that we have here. I mean, these guys are super dedicated and they don't compromise and they don't quit and they work long hours and they're perfectionists and it shows. And that's, that's what we set out to do. So, um, we have some cool new stuff coming out here before long as well. Um, some software features that we didn't have time to get in, um, before, uh, we released it. And so we have a software engineer that's been dedicated to it all summer He's been working on it. I still got a little bit of testing to do and get some beta testers on it. And then uh, we'll be announcing that before long. And it's, it's, it's some cool stuff that it can do that we hadn't just, you know, we're out of time, but I'm glad they're coming in and I think people are really going to like them. Good. Yeah. We'll cover that in a few weeks when all that stuff's public, we'll get into um, some of the new features that you're, you're putting together and uh, update folks. It'll probably be a short show but we'll just talk about those little changes that you made. But so far, man, it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure to use it, You guys have done a great job. I like that. Um, when I call you up and say, Hey, I don't like this or this didn't work, or this is a problem that you guys have gone out and addressed it and addressed it and addressed it quickly. In fact, I got in trouble a couple of times cause, uh, I didn't run the updates on it, uh, after you guys fixed it and you're like, dude, we fix it. And then you don't update it and what, what the hell? And, uh, I was just, tr I was on the road, Chad. So I had a hard time like getting everything dialed. No, I just need, uh, I need Brent's email or something. That I, <laughs> I, I know it'll get done if I send it to him. Yeah. Uh, it, life's a little chaotic here at Gritty, but, um, um, so far, the uh, all the latest updates have been incredible. So let's say a guy already has the site, uh, but he doesn't have the right version on there. How does he get it? Okay, so to check your version, you would just hit the OK button, flip through the menus until you get to a little cog wheel, and then you, you go into there. There's all the settings in there. There's a I think there's a page called About, and you go see what software version you're on. If you're not on 2.80, then you go out to the web and you just type in Garmin Express in your Google browser. It's a web app. Um, it stalls on your desktop, and then you basically connect your site. It'll rec recognize it. It'll recognize it. It doesn't have 2.80 on there, and it will basically download the update, put it on there, put your battery door back on, and it'll run it, and you'll be up and running with, with the latest and greatest software. So, it, yep, it's super easy. Awesome. All right, Chad. Any last words? Anything you want to – any any gritty advice? Anything you want to throw out there? <laughs> I can't think of anything at the moment. Uh, thanks for saving my number and, and, and yelling at me a few times. I appreciate it. And letting me come back on and, and uh, go through some of these things with you. I really appreciate it. Carmen, appreciate you as well. Yeah. So my pleasure. E even though we don't pay you. <laughs> hey, it's uh it's a, it's, it actually is nice. Cause if I don't like it, I can just chuck it. I know exactly. That's, <laughs> that's part of the benefit. All right, so, Chad, thanks for joining right. us. And, uh, Folks, if you like the show, um, please go out and leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, leave us a comment on uh, YouTube. Like, subscribe, all the things. Do all the things. And uh, if you um, have any questions about the site, you can reach out to me, uh, as always, or you can reach out to Chad at Garmin. Uh, Chad, how can people get a hold of you? Um, they can call uh, customer support or, um, I'm on Instagram as Chad Van camp three, um, go that route and I'll try to answer any questions I can, but, um, okay. there's a lot of information on our website, uh, www.garmin.com forward slash zero spelled X E R O. Okay. Perfect. 
All right, folks. Have a good one. Stay greedy. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>